Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hey everyone, Kristen Walker here and we're here with Dr. Mark Goulston. Hi, Mark. Hello, Kristen. (laughs) Now we are going to talk about um, narcissistic inventory and how to use it, which I think is fascinating. Um, being able to, anybody that's de- that deals with narcissists needs some sort of checklist as well as a toolbox of emotional boundary protecting skills <laughs> to get through these relationships. So I love your checklist. So I thought we could read it off. Um, it says to use the narcissist inventory, rate the person on a, on a one to three scale, one rarely, two sometimes, three frequently. And you had just said that sometimes people um, will look at this list and they say, oh, they know someone like this, but sometimes they read this list and say, oh, I do that. Well, you know, you're absolutely true. We'll read, read this, but there's a little bit of a, a backstory. Um, I actually put out a tweet today. I put out surveys on tw- Twitter, and I was actually talking about manipulative people, but narcissistic people are sort of manipulative in ways. And, and I said, is the problem with manipulative people that they're manipulative or you're afraid to say no to them? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's true with narcissistic people. They can trigger in you a fear of saying no to them because there's something that's really close whenever you read up a narcissistic people, and that's called narcissistic rage. Mm. And, and the thing about narcissistic rage, and I don't want to get into politics, but people will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but narcissistic rage is these are people who seem to have no trouble going over the cliff, but they really don't go over the cliff. They verbally do things. They don't necessarily beat you up or anything, but when they have no trouble escalating further than you, you dare to go, hmm. that's when they have you. Hmm. And so, escalating meaning escalating, in what ways? Well, escalating meaning if you tend to push back or say no, or I don't think so, or I don't agree with that, um, I guess I can say this, but I, I don't want anyone to think I'm making reference. But when you come back with them, anything they don't want to hear, they have a way of trumping your remark. Mm. Gotcha. You know, and, and and shoving it back down your throat. But let's read the inventory because we okay. keep it up that way. And I don't I don't suffer so much from narcissism as I do from ADD. So we- <laughs> So we got to bring it back to the promise. Gotcha. Let's bring it back. Use the narcissistic inventory. Remember, we said rate the person on a scale of one to three, one rarely, two, sometimes three frequently. Number one, how often does the person need to be right at all costs? Yeah. That's all, we'll take turns. So you did what? How often mm-hmm. does the person need to be right at all costs? Number two, how often does the person act impatient with you for no good reason? Yep. How often does the person interrupt you in the middle of what you're saying and yet take offense if you interrupt? 
Okay, so it's okay to interrupt. It's the taking offense part. <laughs> no, they interrupt you, but then if you dare to interrupt them, they take offense. Gotcha. Okay, how often does the person expect you to drop whatever you're thinking about and listen to him or her? And does the person take offense when you expect the same in return? How often does the person talk more than he or she listens? How often does the person say, yes, but that's not true, no, however, or your problem is, I would add to that, or you're an idiot. <laughs> right. How often does the person resist and resent doing something that matters to you just because it's inconvenient? How often does the person expect you to cheerfully do something that's inconvenient for you? How often does the person expect you to accept behavior that he or she would refuse to accept from you? And finally, how often does the person fail to say thank you, I'm sorry, congratulations, or excuse me when it's called for? Mm, okay. So you score up your inventory and 10 points 10 through 16 is the person is cooperative 17 through 20 the person is argumentative 24 through 30 the person is, is a narcissist and, and i want to say so this is very tongue-in-cheek so um, <laughs> and it'll show you my battle with the establishment uh, something that i i learned a number of years ago is to use experience near language versus experience distant language so and that's and that's because when you use experience near language the other person not only understands what you say intellectually but they can feel it and they lean into that mm. and the problem with a lot of people who are too academic or clinical they use acad they use experience distant language and so they use jargon so I'm saying that because my I think this inventory, which has been republished all over the place, I think people like it because it's experience near language. Hopefully you can actually picture people doing those things, whereas often some of the narcissist rating scales, they, they sound clinical. Right. And to me, I wouldn't say it's narcissism, but I think, you know, some of the more academic institutions have a way of making you feel that we know what we're talking about and you're just the silly patient. Right, exactly, yes. Yeah, and I, I find this interesting too. I, I remember this gentleman, well, that's hard to call him that. I remember this male that I had to, uh, that I worked with for a very short time who wanted to be my co-host on shows and wanted me to do a podcast with him on the network that was our show and all that. And, and it was a great learning experience for me because it was before I started having regular guest hosts and it was before I became a network with multiple shows. So it was the lesson in it was great because it warmed me up to doing the network. But the problem was um, he was absolutely a raging narcissist. Everybody was the Don. Oh yeah, my, my wife is the Don or my best friend is the Don. He was the Don. And no matter how many hoops that you would jump through for this person, it was never enough, never enough. And that, uh, that narcissistic rage that you're talking about, that boiled underneath the surface of him all the time. So I, it was really interesting to be kind of drawn into that and to see how I behaved around him and to see how everybody else behaved. Around. Everybody catered to this guy. Like if he wanted to play his music really loud, Everybody that even at his work had to sit down and listen and listen to his music. Like it just the, the, the world completely revolved, you know, around him and people jumped to, to do that. And I, I always find that fascinating when you get very entitled um, people that are also probably personality disordered. Um, the world does tend to jump to them. <laughs> Well, I'll, fascinating. Well, I'll, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Because uh, I think I'm a little bit better in dealing with those people, but I used to be. I would jump, and sometimes be somewhere between mincemeat and roadkill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And what I realize it is is narcissists uh, 
And narcissists can also come in the form of whiners and complainers. Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, the, vict- the victim narcissist. Mm-hmm. And, and what I've discovered is the way, at least I'm speaking for myself, I think the way that people got to me, the narcissists, the, uh, the high maintenance people, is they would push me into my rage, which I was uncomfortable with. In other words, they would, they would push me into my shadow. Mm, yes. Yes. And my shadow was, I want to eviscerate them. And that's not how I, that's how, that's not how I like to see myself. Oh, I can relate to that. Yes. And so at the point that they push you into your rage, you, re, you literally and neurologically bifurcate in your brain because you, because what, they've triggered something that I can think I can get away with on the network. They've triggered an amygdala hijack, mm. which and an amyg- what the amygdala hijack is for people who may not know, it actually signals the blood flow to go from your upper brain to your lower brain. It shunts the blood into your survival brain. So you actually can't think. It goes into your fight or flight or emotional brain, but you can't think. And so what happens is when they are so appalling that they trigger you, you can't think. Right. And, you're, and you're there at either fight, flight, or the third alternative, which we don't talk about, is freeze. Fight, flight, or freeze. Right. And then what happens is as that's going on, we start getting more agitated. We have lesser access to being able to think. And then they, then they get the better of us because we, we want to deny the fact that I just want to kill them right now. <laughs> and, I'm a, and I'm a lover, not a fighter. But mm. I want to kill this person in a fiery car crash. <laughs> right. And I, want, and I want to take delight in that. Oh, my God, I'm evil. Right. And so that's our shadow. And, uh, uh, and they get to us that way. And so uh, my most recent book, is, as you know, is called Talking to Crazy, How to Deal with the irrational, impossible people in your life. And it's not about mental illness. It's about basically about personality disorders who get the better of us and push us into our rage. (sighs) And one of the tips that I give people is know who those people are ahead of time. And you can list them. You can list on, uh, you can put down on a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle on the one side say, put down the names of the people that you dread interacting with and you're exhausted after you leave them. Right. And then uh, on the other side, put down the names of the people that actually lift you up and you look forward to seeing them and you say to yourself, gee, I really should talk to them more often. But what happens is you don't do it that more often because you're so busy getting caught up with the people on the other side of the page right. and resenting them that you, need, that you need to take a nap after you deal with those uh, close encounters of the worst kind. Yes, so true. It's very, it's so true. And what I always find fascinating is this can be someone who everyone is complaining about their behavior. Uh, everyone in a work setting or in a family setting, whatever, everyone is like, this person is out of control. However, when you finally blow it, you know, get to that rage place yourself or, you know, to go to your shadow and you just unleash your own, you are horrible. Do you not see how you behave that affects everybody? They usually end up sitting there shocked it's like you've skinned them alive, wounded them horribly, and they usually end up sitting there shocked going, God, I had, I had no idea you carried this much animosity towards me. <laughs> and you're like, how are you this clueless? I've loaned you money. I've bought things for you. I've done this. I've introduced you to this person, and it's never enough, and you just want more. And your ego is completely out of control, and you're clueless as to why this would make someone have animosity towards you. Fascinating. But they really are. Many of them really are. Yeah, because no one has ever, ever talked to them that way. Did I share in any of our podcasts the F. Lee Bailey story? Mm -mm, No. Oh, so uh, I often give a talk on how to deal with the most difficult people in your life. And I share a story about one day where I learned 80% of what I know about difficult people, and it was on September 5th, 1995. <laughs> and I say to the audience, you know where you were. Don't, don't you remember September 5th, 1995? And this will work for people. They have to be at least 40 years old. Mm-hmm. Listen, I don't remember that. 
I'll say, do you remember a little trial called the O.J. Simpson trial? They said, yes. I said, and do you remember some of the characters in that? Do you remember Marsha Clark and O.J. and Johnny Cochran? Yeah. Do you remember a guy named Detective Mark Furman? And anyone who followed the trial remembers him. Right. I said, well, uh, on September 5th, 1995, the world was watching Detective Mark Furman take the Fifth Amendment uh, because he had been accused of saying the N word hmm. and uh, during during the middle of the trial, and now he was going to take the Fifth Amendment. And everybody in the world was watching that except me. That's because I was in the top floor of the criminal courts building. I was being sequestered Ooh. because I worked with the prosecution in the O.J. Simpson trial, and F. Lee Bailey had accused me of coaching, drugging, medicating him so he could withstand his testimony in the cross-examination where he came off like John Wayne. That was the middle of the trial. And this was the end of the trial. And so if he hadn't taken the Fifth Amendment, F. Lee Bailey was going to question me to see if he perjured himself. But I didn't know that he took the Fifth Amendment. I was just up there. And it's really true that when you really put yourself in a difficult place, you, I'm telling you, your life does flash, flash before your eyes. Yeah. But 5 p.m., I'm thinking, oh, I'm being set up. I don't know what's going on down there. <laughs> and then at 7 p.m., in walks F. Lee Bailey, a fellow named Carl Douglas, who was a partner of Johnny Cochran, and the person to, to kind of chaperone me, Bill Hodgman. He was one of the first prosecutors. He worked with Marsha Clark and was replaced by Chris Darden. And so what happened is around 5 p.m., I'm getting anxious, a little bit panicky, but this is not new for me in my life. I always seek situations that make me almost panicky because I never panic. I always get smart. And I must have narcolepsy because I'm always seeking out situations that are crazy. You know, like I go speak in Moscow to teach empathy to the Russian Federation. That's crazy. <laughs> Everybody told me, what are you doing? And I did that two years ago. And it was such a hit. I'm going back this October <laughs> again. Fantastic. And, and, so, so but what I realized uh, just before I got panicked, I said, he's going to come up, he's going to charm me, he's going to frustrate me, he's going to anger me, and then he's going to push me into my rage. Mm. And then when he pushes me into my rage, he's going to make me up, push me off balance. And then if I'm off balance, I'll say something incriminating. And so I, I had him hardwired because I saw that's what he did. Okay. And so he comes in and I was so confident of what he was going to do, that he sits down across from me at a table and, and I'm fiddling with stuff in front of me because I want to lull him into a false sense of security. Right. And then Bill Hodgman says, Mark, you know, Mr. Bailey's here to ask you questions. And I have this way of looking into people's eyes, which I've cultivated being a suicide interventionist, where I can look into your eyes and I can hold them and I can take them wherever I want them to be. And I used to do that with suicidal people as a way of holding on to them and saying, I'm not going to let you fall through the cracks. Mm. And so I held on to his eyes. And here's why I also learned about innuendo. Innuendo is when people make statements and they're not questioned, but they make statements such as, you know, we don't really know what you do with the trial, Dr. Goulston. We just know you've been here many times during the trial. And that the in the innuendo is that wasn't a question, but normally what you do when someone uses innuendo, you go uh huh, and then they say something else, and you go uh huh uh huh, and when they do that, they're putting a hook in your neck hmm. and reeling you in to chop it off, hmm. which is a bad metaphor for the O.J. Simpson trial, but all right, <laughs> I'm sticking to it. Uh, and and so he does all these innuendos, and instead of going uh huh uh huh. I keep looking him in the eye and I just blink. So when he says, we understand you've been here many times through the trial, instead of going, aha, I just go, and people can't see it on the podcast, but I'm just blinking. Mm -hmm. And nobody else in the room knows that I'm holding onto his eyes. And then he starts to pick up speed. And after about five minutes, Bill Hodgman says to me, Mark, you haven't said a word, meaning I haven't said aha uh -huh about anything. And I looked over to Bill Hodgman and I said, he hasn't asked me a question, Bill. <laughs> and then I looked back at F. Lee Bailey, went back to holding onto his eyes. 
And my look basically said, I'm not perfect, but I'm not hiding a killer. What's your story? Mm. So that's what I informed my eyes. And there was a point in which he starts escalating and he reaches a point where he says, so you're here to say that you never medicated, you never coached, you never influenced, you never did anything to affect Detective Mark Furman's testimony during the cross exam. And so he's saying all this as a way to push me into my rage. Then there were some other insulting things he said. So if you can picture it, Kristen, everyone's looking at me and I'm looking into his eyes calmly. Mm-hmm. And I count to seven. And it's going so well, I go, <clears throat> and everyone leans in like the E.F. Hutton commercial. Oh, he's going to talk. And I count to seven again. And so I'm looking into his eyes. And, I, and, and in, in, a, in a, my own innuendo, I said, Mr. Bailey. And he goes, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Mr. Bailey. He goes, uh-huh. My mind wandered over the last five minutes, and it seemed important. Can you repeat everything you said? Mm. And he said, what? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, my car is parked in a lot, and it's been closed for two hours now. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it out. And I, you know, I was just thinking about that, and it sounded like it was important, whatever you were talking about, but I just missed it. Can, can you repeat everything you said? Mm. And he looked at Carl Douglas as if to say, what did I say? Because, see, difficult people don't have to have substance because if they push you into your rage, you're going to spend all your energy trying to keep a lid on your wanting to either run or eviscerate them. Wow, yes. And so so what's the takeaway from this? Uh, Think of all the difficult people, all the people on that side of the sheet that you dread seeing and that are high maintenance, especially the narcissist. And when you're talking with them, hold a little bit of yourself back. And then when they're pushing you to do something you don't want to do or, or to criticize you or put you down, keep looking them in the eye. And when they do that, and they're expecting to knock you off balance and then do the coup de grace, mm-hmm. pause for a couple seconds because, first of all, that's going to cause them to wonder, gee, he, he she didn't flinch. Right. But this uh, something's not going right here. And then you can say, here are a variety of responses. You can say, could you say that again? Because it sounded important. Or, or you can say, could you say that to me in a normal voice? Because the way you said it to me got me all, you know, all triggered inside. Or you can just look at them, tilt your head slightly and go, huh? And then you watch them. Mm. And, what you'll often see is they can't recoup because their modus operandi is if I can just provoke people, if I can just be so upsetting and appalling, right. I can get the better of them. Like something early on, and I will mention something, you know, uh, about president Trump, but early on when he was uh, running for office and then he was in office, I remember I sent tips to CNN. I said, you know, if you really want to disarm him, instead of taking the bait, when he says something, say something such as, uh, you're really passionate about what you're saying, aren't you, President Trump? Uh Mm Uh-huh. And you're not just passionate, it's really important to you. Isn't that true? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Well, I'll tell you, uh, if you can tell me how you came to that conclusion what you ruled out as alternatives and how you've come to that as the best course of action for us to take. If it makes sense and it seems doable and it feels sound, I'm going to go to bat for you with my fellow reporters on CNN and say, you know, you know, the guys really thought this through. He wouldn't be able to answer that. Right. Do you follow me? Yeah, so I do. And I thought I thought if people ignored him too, like if they just didn't, he wants attention. So just don't react. No, so I, I, I think you can do that. Uh, I, and I think that's the best way with narcissists and whatever is to just is, but the key is know ahead of time who these people are and always expect them to do something bullying Mm -hmm. And then when they do that, 
they have they haven't you're not totally there with your chin stuck out for them to, for them to knock it off knock right. your head off and some of them are very covert in their bullying Mm-hmm. You know, say, say more about that. I just saw. I just saw a smile. <laughs> Keep your rage down there, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know they they can they can uh, bully you in the in a way of ignoring you. Uh, they can bully you in a way of um, no matter how. Okay, let me give it a better example. So you have someone who says they have this fantastic, amazing thing that they've created. Uh, but nobody see it's kind of like Trump with his tax returns. When will they ever be, you know, but anyway, you have someone that has this amazing thing that they've created and they own it and they have never shown proof of it. They don't have a concept of it. It's just all kind of in their head, but they're a genius and they attract people with their passion to come in and and they're very successful at getting these people who do have degrees or, or whatever and really do know this field that, they're, that, they, that this narcissist believes that they own the market on. And they will get these well-meaning people to do the work for them. And how they'll do it is by just not answering, like Trump does with the tax return thing, just not answering. And so good, you know, nice people or codependent people will go ahead and start doing their work for them and then they will go, I, you know, I sat around, I waited for you to give me a response and you never did. So I went ahead and did the work and then they'll take that work and go, yeah, that's exactly what I have already when they have nothing. And, w- and then they kind of wonder why people drop like flies from their life, why people blow up and get angry with them because they get very resentful. They, if they don't see that that's what this person does, they certainly feel it somewhere. And this isn't someone that's yelling and screaming and, you know, being a bully in a very overt way, but they're covertly usurping people's time and energy for their own ends. And, you know, the, the, the end of it is, but I'm the genius. You did all that work, but that was from my genius. Does that make sense? Oh, oh total sense. Uh, in fact, I know, and, and I'm sure they're not the same people, but I'm sure you know of some people who are one trick ponies, but the world says, oh, you're a visionary. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. And what it is, is they weren't a visionary. They were a first mover. They saw some opportunity. Now that's a certain talent. If they saw an opportunity and they seized it, but when the world calls them visionaries, they love the feel of it. Yes. I've known some of these people. And what happens is they can't repeat their success and they beat the hell out of their people. They're abusive because they don't want to give up that thing. You're a visionary. Right. In fact, I saw saw someone like that recently, and I said, uh, I said, uh, I'm going to give you a a tip or suggestion, and I'm hesitant because, you know, I'm pausing because you really seem like an asshole, and I don't help (laughs) assholes, but I'm going to give you a tip that will, I think will be helpful, and we'll see what you do with it. And I said, you know, um, if you could meet with the people who you want to think you're a visionary, but you're really not, you're an opportunist. Yes. I think if you were to say to them, I have a confession to make. There's good news and bad news. Uh, The bad news is thank you for looking at me as I'm a visionary, as if I'm a visionary. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, but what I am is I can see an opportunity and I can, and the good news is I hire visionaries, but they work for me. They're creative. Mm-hmm. I think if they developed, you know, enough of whatever they need to develop, they'll go out and start their own companies. So the bad news is I've been portraying myself as this visionary and I really am not one. And, you know, there's all kinds of insecurities fueling it, but, I was smart enough to bring in people who are visionaries and they deserve a lot of credit. And I want to apologize for having not given them credit. Right. And I want to apologize to you for conning you. Yes. And, and I told them, I said, if you could be that gracious and humble, you'll, you'll, people will love it because one of the good news for people like you 
And it's bad news for nice people because nice people often don't finish first is when a person like you, who's an asshole can suddenly reform and truly reform, you cause all the people who only feel fear and loathing towards you to not have to be afraid or hate you. And the experience of that is like ecstasy. Mm. And the amazing ecstasy they feel, oh, I don't have to be afraid of him. I don't have to be, I don't have to uh, 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 be angry at him. The relief they feel is so huge that they'll follow you even more and much more than someone who's been nice all along. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's, it, you're right about going, they do like to push you to that place where you're incapable of being rational. A therapist I had said that uh, over about one narcissist I was around, he just makes you the most polarized version of yourself. Oh, I like that. Say more about that. that that's filled with all kinds of wisdom. <laughs> it was that the more he, he would throw these little covert, manipulative uh, gut punches always to everybody, not just me. And, and then he would get quiet. And he used to brag about how he could just sit and there could be people steaming angry with him and he would just stay quiet. And then he would decide when to stir the pot. And I would watch him do this because I was a consultant. So I wasn't an employee. I was in a different position with him mm -hmm. than they were. And I would say, this is horrible. You're messing around with people's psychology. You're, this is emotional trauma, damage that you're doing to people. And um, he enjoyed me seeing how he really is. Like he got off on that. How, how disturbed he really was. And so I got so angry about that, that I would get, the quieter he would get, the more I would, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, louder and louder until I finally, you know, heard that sentence and went, ah, I see, I see. Is that I'm, he's setting me up to be the one that's the bad one because I'm getting louder and louder and louder. And I'm trying to now go after him when all this time he's been seeding the field to... Yeah. So, you bring, so you bring up a good point. When do we stop allowing or enabling mm -hmm. narcissists to get the better of us? And I think there has to be a point where you say enough already. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and there's, there's a point at which you stop being so angry at them. Yeah. You look at yourself and you say, uh, I'm, a, I'm the fool who allows it. Yep. Uh, I have a good friend who, who gives me all these truths, which I can't stand because they're just so wise. <laughs> and he says, you become what you tolerate. Yes, so true. You know, and so I think when you reach that point, I'll tell you a wake up call for, for me is uh, when I'm so busy trying to win them over, get their approval that I start <laughs> ignoring the people who care about me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Remember, my, my wife said something to me years ago when I was whining about, oh, I refer patients to the big university, and not only don't they say thank you, which they don't have to, they never refer them back to me because I'm just some local community psychiatrist, but they're the mecca, well, because they need, they need to fill all their clinics. Right. And I remember she said to me, she said, you know, when you're trying to get approval uh, and uh, acceptance from people above you who are trying to hold on to power and patience, which you're never going to get. For every one of those people above you that you're chasing after love and approval in all the wrong directions, she said, there's literally tens, and now that you're pretty influential, hundreds or even thousands because of your books, who are below you, who are looking up to you and hoping you don't have feet of clay. Ooh. Oh boy, that just hit me. You know, and, and, and what's happening is while you're complaining about the people above you or the narcissistic institutions, you're making the people who are peers or the people below you who look up to you to feel like they're chopped liver. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, and that hit me in a good way. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a, one of those wifeisms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In fact, one of the driving forces for me is honoring the trust that people have in me below me. Not wanting to dishonor their trust. That brings out the real best in me as opposed to being worried that I'll disappoint the people above me who are often, you know, you know many of them are caught up in themselves. Right, right. Yeah, and I think too, when you abandon things uh, that normally matter to you, you know, I, I had someone that, you know, would go and talk all the time to people about, oh, don't date after these abusive relationships. You need to take time to heal yourself, blah, blah, blah. And they were really good at saying all these things, but they couldn't stick it out in therapy to save themselves because they knew more than any therapist. And the moment that a, you know, that they wanted a, a partner in their life, they put their kids at risk, they put their job at risk, you know, they did all these things in order to make that happen. And uh, I thought, well, what kind of narcissism drives, you know, drives this behavior? I, I, w- I always thought that was fascinating. Um, but, you know, it's like the Jerry Falwells that get up and say what they say and then, <laughs> and then end up in a movie theater with somebody <laughs> doing not great things. So you just never, you, you never know. People can talk a really good game. Yeah, you, you reminding me of a question that I learned from someone. Uh, Because another thing about narcissists is they feel or act entitled to more than they really deserve. Yes, absolutely. So for listeners, deserved is what you've earned. Entitled is what you grab for that you haven't earned. And I think another good comeback, although I'd like to defer to what you say, is just ignore them. (laughs) Just ignore them and make better choices. Yeah. You know, but one thing you can say to them is pause. Don't get provoked and say, um, tell me what it is that you feel you're entitled to and tell me what it is that you've done so that you deserve what you're entitled to. Right. Yeah. I've, I did say that to someone recently and they, and they stuttered. They could not, they literally could not stop stuttering. Oh. <laughs> and I, I think about that with people, you know, people, younger people, sometimes they can be caught up in a narcissistic phase and social media doesn't help. Um, and some young people, I'm talking, you know, 25 and below will say, well, I'm just this big brain and I'm going to, and I just need to go sit in a room and fart out ideas and I'll just have lots of people in my life that will take notes and put those ideas into action because I'm so brilliant. That's all I need to do is is sit in this room. (laughs) And I'm like, I remember telling someone that was telling me that I said, listen, I'm so sorry to burst your bubble, but you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and dig in the dirt and sweat it out just like the rest of us. Otherwise, you if you are a genius, you're going to be one of those geniuses that when you're 70 and you're driving a cab, which there's nothing wrong with driving a cab, but it's not what they wanted to do with their life, um, that is bitter and resentful because of all the people that stole your great ideas because you never freaking actually broke a sweat to put them into action. You know... You're speaking about me. <laughs> I'm not. No, no, no. Here's the partial truth, you know, because uh, I, I like these confessionals. Um, <laughs> you know, as you well know, because we're getting to know each other, uh, I'm an idea factory. Yeah, me too. I never expect anyone to do anything with them. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm realizing that if they're going to go anywhere, I have to do something with them. And I'll tell you my hesitation, so hopefully I'm not a narcissist, I'm just a fool, is uh, uh, my skills at doing something with them are so paltry compared to some of the ideas. So -hmm. what I'm now doing is finding wonderful people like you, introducing you to other people, and I say, I think there's something there. And if you agree, see if there's something there. And so I'm having a great time because I'm introducing good people to good people and potential. And, uh, you know, I feel like Johnny Applegood. I go around, you know, I see, here's a little good. Yeah, try this, give them a call. And that's what I do. And, you know, and that's why I'm not like the other old farts my age and, uh, you know, playing tennis and being oblivious. And uh, 
Uh, well, that, that's where you're not a narcissist because a narcissist would never have the self-reflection, first of all, to say any of that. And they wouldn't be happy about this great attention going towards other people because they'd want it for themselves. <laughs> but, you know, to, to be honest, I don't want the attention. Yeah, you issue it away. A narcissist well, well, want the attention. Well, here's part of what it is. And I, this is not about narcissists. This is about Mark. Um, <laughs> And people don't know that you and I are forming this great friendship. Right. At my, at my core, I'm a lonesome we. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do it's anything on my own because it's just so lonesome. And mm -hmm. so when I find wonderful people like you and say, hey, let's keep putting our heads together, see what we can create. To me, there's really sort of nothing better than that. I, I, I think I'd Absolutely. I think I'd rather be behind the camera, be the executive producer, be the whatever. I, I don't want to be in front of the camera. Which means which reminds me we gotta go in front of the camera. No, we I'm gonna just flip it at some point. I'm because our <laughs> conversation was so good, I'm gonna take a snippet of this and, and cut it for the camera because it's it's recording that. Um what's what's funny is um I don't like to be in front of the camera either i really don't i don't have a desire to go be a public speaker by I, although i've done it and i do it and i've talked about very hard tough subjects but i don't really like it i'm not someone that gets off on being the center of attention but i like like you say i i the part of being on camera that i like is i like interviewing other people on camera. I like doing it off camera too, but I really also like doing it on camera. So I guess I sort of don't mind the camera anymore, but I don't at all. The thought of being on the other side, being the interviewee, mm -hmm. the one being interviewed, uh, that's, I'll do it if I have to. And I feel like it's going to shine a light on the network and, you know, all the stuff that we do here. I'll do that. But I, I don't really seek i do not seek that out <laughs> at all well, you know it may be that there's a part of you that so for me um my shadow there is a there is a self-promotional part of my shadow but it's part of my shadow right same i don't same. like it I'm, i i don't feel i feel like i'm at my best when i'm really listening i wrote a book on it it's in the back you can see it but um uh and when I have to go into the selling promotional thing, it feels, it feels like something's gotten corrupted in my head. Like mm. I'll have to, oh, oh, you have to now close whatever that means. I'll share a funny anecdote and then we can sort of switch. Uh, uh, I often have breakfast with Larry King. He has this breakfast club and uh, he's old, he's sick, but hopefully he's rallying. And, he, he just sort of holds court and it gets him out of bed in the morning. Mm. And he was talking about how he's never been nervous in front of the camera or speaking. And he has this great anecdote. He said, uh, he remembers the first day that he was on radio as a DJ in Miami. And this is way before television. He's 85. Right. And he said, uh, he said, growing up, I knew I wanted to be on radio because I'd listen to people on radio you know, in our living room. And I said, I want to do that one day. And so there I get my chance and I'm going to be a DJ and I'm in Miami. And the studio uh, uh, manager says, okay, uh, Larry, you're on. So, uh, you know, you'll have to announce yourself. And, and his, his birth name is Larry Zeiger. And so the, the guy says, you can't be Larry Zeiger as a DJ. So Larry says, oh, oh, and he says, I looked over my shoulder and I saw a newspaper and it says King's Market sale. And so he said, oh, I'll be Larry King. And he said, <laughs> here's what I learned and why I'm never nervous. If you're honest with your audience, he said, I got on. He said, uh, he said, uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Larry King. And that's the first time I've ever heard it. <laughs> he said, I've always wanted to be on the radio. And I'm very nervous now because this is my first show. Aww. I don't really know, you know, all the bells and whistles here and what I'm supposed to do, but I'll find my way. So I just hope you'll bear with me. And, you know, and together, you know, hopefully we'll have a good show, see where it leads. And 
Uh, and he said, if you're just honest with your audience, it's like what Mark Twain said, I think, if you always tell the truth, you never have to watch what you say. Right. And, and I think it is a great way to be. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to cultivate that because every time out of insecurity, I'm trying to push something or sell something or impress someone, you know, I, I, I may get away with it, you know, because right. some, I occasionally say things that you know, to the average person sound impressive, but afterwards I say, oh, you did it again, Mark. Right. right. <laughs> right. I know it's that monitoring. I do that too. I'll go, yeah, okay. I had a pretty narcissistic individual, you know, come into my life and I joined in their dance of fantasy Island for a bit and yeah. it, and it, and it can be euphoric. Oh yeah. For for a bit. It really can. And and to sit back and go, okay, I'm coming back down to earth. Because yeah. that was fun. But you know, bills gotta be paid, sweat's gotta be dripped, you know. I I gotta get back into I'm not gonna live in Fantasy Island with you. It was yeah. a it was a nice visit, but now I'm back down to earth. And what's interesting about that is the minute that you see the minute that you stop believing in the fantasy island, that you see what's really going on, you become the last person that they want anything to do with. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 because because they, uh, well, you're right. It's it's they can either agitate you or they they can just so intoxicate you. Yes, but but once they know that you don't believe in their stuff anymore you do you are the last person they want to be around because they can't they don't have any power anymore they can't convince you they can't intoxicate you and they can't agitate you you're just like mm, whatever uh, but you know but because they're dyed in the wool that way they just go on to the next person absolutely you know, absolutely you know, that's why they can oh, yeah. yeah that's that's why they can just you know immediately move on to something else there's there's a billion people in the world that they can go and work their you know their charms on you were you were one of the billion so take mm -hmm. your gift out of what you got in being in that relationship and um and you know i always come out better after having been in them even though they feel awful and i probably spent more money than i wanted to uh but i always have learned something fantastic that i take with me to evolve and do something better and i will look back five years from that relationship and just sort of quizzically look to see what they've been up to and they're doing the same thing. You as someone who evolves more rapidly anyway, will have had 50 lifetimes of stuff going on. And it's like, it's a time warp that they never left. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that, that's why you need to, well, you know, I, you know, that's why you need to have buddies like you and I are becoming, you know, maybe we need to be sponsors of each other because, <laughs> um, because, it's not a bad idea. And if you're listening, it's not a bad idea to have someone in your life and who you can accept their critiques and criticism because it's laced with love. And mm -hmm. if you check with them once a month and what you're, what you're going to do is you're going to share anything you're doing that your gut tells you you shouldn't do. Oh, yeah. That's so don't do don't, don't do that with the naysayers who say, you know, I told you so. You know why aren't you know why aren't you why you have to be different? Why are you always have to be such and such? So do it with people who appreciate that you're, your uniqueness. But I think checking in with them, and they check in with you, and and you can sort of just say anything you're doing or anyone you're interacting with, you know, that raises a red flag. Just see where it takes you. Right. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good thing. Boy, and and having to sit and comb through who possibly could be in your life that isn't really healthy for you, boy, being accountable to taking that kind of inventory. Mm -hmm. That's um that's a that can be a tall order because when you're in voodoo land, fantasy island land with an intoxicating narcissist, albeit however short that time may be, you don't want to take that kind of an inventory. <laughs> Because it's so intoxicating. Right, until it's not. <laughs> until it becomes Chernobyl. And that concludes our discussion. <laughs> I want to make sure listeners know um, the article that we are going to keep 
about, we're going to put this in the show notes, is The Narcissist Inventory. Sound like anyone you know? And it is written by Dr. Mark Goulston, who is an author, speaker, podcast host on our network. Thank you very much. And psychiatrist. And um, Mark, tell our listeners where they can find all your books. Well, if you go to Amazon, uh, the good news is I'm on Amazon. The bad news is you'll never remember how to spell my name. (laughs) G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N. Also, I, I have a website, markgoulston.com. Uh, something that I'm, uh, and I do have a podcast, and I'm going to have a new one, but I have yeah. a podcast called My Wake Up Call, which you can find on the Mental Health News Radio Network, and I'm so mm-hmm. proud to be part of that. And I'm part of a document, where you could really help me is I'm part of a documentary called Stay Alive, uh, which you can find at youtube.com forward slash stay alive video. And it, it actually won an, an award in the Los Angeles Film Awards Festival. Nice. And I, inter- I interviewed Kevin Hines, and he's this uh, fellow who jumped off the Golden Bridge and survived. And he's saving lives all around the world. And I just saw that he's being featured on CNN as, you know, you know one of the significant people of 2018. Oh, good for him. And uh, and we hope you'll check out the documentary and we hope if you like it, that you'll share it with people and see if we can all save lives together. Yeah. And we'll be launching the Stay Alive podcast on the network also. So exciting. Well, thank you for doing this and doing some of it on camera. (laughs) Oh, great. You mean some of it was on camera? Well, all of it was, but we're going to clip little pieces out of it. Okay. Well, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) The listeners, thank you for tuning in to another edition of Mental Health News Radio. I know, I know, no one likes commercials, but seriously, folks, without the help from these organizations, we could not stay on the air. Please give a shout out to zencharts.com. If you're a mental health or addiction treatment center, you'll want to use their EHR. It's gorgeous. And they're just good people. And also my genetics, M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, because knowing your genetic code empowers your mental health treatment. And lastly, copenotes.com. We love getting positive messages right to our phones every day from Johnny Crowder. He's the lead singer of Prison, a heavy metal band sharing their music about suicide prevention, addiction recovery, and mental health. See, that was painless. Support them as they support us. Back to the show. Sometimes I'm passive aggressive, but never without good intentions. I heat up and act on my emotions. Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all, we promised we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you I can fight it. Good boy.